Hi everyone, it's great to be with you this morning and I just want to welcome you and to thank you very much for taking time out of your schedules to join us uh, today or this evening. Um, I'd like to also say how wonderful it is to see so many of you here today. Uh, I think the COVID-19 pandemic has brought about so much uncertainty and uh, challenge to us all and has stopped us traveling the globe, but it's been amazing that we've been able to uh, see one another in these digital settings. And I think it's almost facilitated greater contact uh, with our uh, alumni. So great to be with you today. Uh, my name is Tansy Jessup and I'm the Pro Vice Chancellor Education at Bristol. Uh, it's been a real honor and privilege to have been at Bristol for the last 18 months, challenging too. Um, and what I love about Bristol, and we all love, is it's a, a city that is just thrumming with innovation and creativity. In 2017, the city was named the leading smart city in the UK, Smart Cities Index. And it's become famous for its Bristol approach, which is community-led and issue-led. Uh, so it's really exciting to be with you coming in and calling in from Bristol. Um, Recognizing the importance of uh, digital futures, the university has brought in two of our, well, one of our phenomenal leaders, Professor Dimitra Simonidou. She's an engineer and sadly, Professor Susan Halford, a sociologist is unable to be with us today, but they lead the Bristol Futures uh, Institute and um, the Digital Futures Institute. And Dimitra is going to speak on behalf of both of them today. Um, I'm delighted to be joined today with, by uh, Demetra and our Pro-Chancellor and alumnus, Andrew Sheng. So without further ado, I'd like to open today's event. We are delighted to have alumnus and distinguished guest, uh, Andrew Sheng, to facilitate today's conversation with Professor Demetra Simonidou on responsible digital innovation for the future. Andrew is a distinguished fellow of the Asia Global Institute and pro-chancellor at the University of Bristol. I would like to invite Andrew to tell us more about his illustrious background and why he's passionate about digital futures. Andrew. Thank you. Thank you, Nancy. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, like all international students, I first came to Bristol uh, trying to learn about Britain, actually. And Bristol was my first choice uh, because I wanted to get a first class education and get to know uh, English friends. And many of them uh, have been my friends for, the, you know, for my whole life. So it's wonderful. I studied economics and I was very pleased to be uh, under some inspirational tutors and professors. Uh, they gave me the confidence uh, to appreciate how to deal with the great challenges of life such as learning how to be digital in today's world. Um, and uh, since then, I went to become a chartered accountant, uh, then came back to Malaysia, uh, worked at the central bank. And then uh, in 69, I went to the World Bank. Uh, from, I spent five years there. When, from there, I went to Hong Kong, became the deputy chief executive of the Hong Kong Monetary Authority, spent five years as the chairman of the uh, Securities and Futures Commission and then after that, I went to work in China as the uh, uh, chief advisor to the China Banking and today uh, Insurance Regulatory Commission. And on return, I became the uh, distinguished fellow at the Asia Global Institute, um, you know, uh, doing some work on think tanks on how Asia is going to deal with some of the real challenges of the world today. And we, we do have a lot. So I'm extremely honored to be uh, uh, appointed as one of the pro-chancellors of Bristol University, uh, which would give me the opportunity to, to contribute to the future development of this great university. Now, um, we all said that uh, digital futures is the way to go. And it's something I feel very passionate about because uh, when I started, uh, computers was all about uh, ca cards, paper cards, and today it's all over the place. And we can't get a better uh, person to introduce this subject, then the fact that Bristol has created this uh, Bristol's Futures, uh, Digital Futures Institute, and it's led by Professor D Dimitra. Um, 
this is, this is an area where all of us are learning. And the strange part is that the young know more about digital than old fuddy-duddies like myself. <laughs> so we're looking very much to uh, how Demetra is going to showcase uh, Bristol's unique and important contributions in this area. Mm -hmm. So uh, over to you, Dimitra. Uh, thank you very much, Andrew, and uh, hello, everybody. I'm really delighted to have the opportunity to uh, discuss more about our new institute, the Bristol Digital Future Institute. I'm going to call it from now on BDFI because it's quite a mouthful to, to, say, to say the whole. Uh, so BDFI is a truly interdisciplinary uh, university Research Institute. As University Research Institute, we have the remit to work across all faculties uh, within our university. And our university has a full range of faculties from engineering to social sciences to humanities and so on. So we are working across all this community in order actually to be, to, 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 to get, to be informed uh, across all these disciplines and develop methodologies to drive digital innovation for the future. Now, let me go a little bit on the very short history of BDFI. We were only established last year in 2019. We have been founded by two initial faculties, although we are working across all, as I mentioned. So the Faculty of Social Sciences and the Faculty of Engineering. And this actually is very much also mirrored into the leadership of our, our institute, I myself am one uh, of the co-directors coming from the Faculty of Engineering. My co-director is a well-known sociologist, Prof Professor Susan Halford, who unfortunately cannot, cannot be here at the moment. Uh, so we have been also very uh, privileged to be funded quite generously by a public organization in the UK called Research England and also co-funded by 27 partners, including big tech industry, but also community organizations and the third sector. The total funding that we received last year is over 100 million. So this is a very serious pursuit, not only because of the money, but also because of the target. And our target actually is to create the world first socio-technical labs that they would drive uh, digital innovation for a better future. Now we have some, some, some quite distinct proposition. So our methodologies, although not fully developed yet, so it's an exploration, it's a research pursuit, how we can develop these methodologies. Our methodologies are deeply uh, based on co-creation and what we call make it clear. And our premise, and that's why we are establishing our labs, is actually to bring early concepts of future technologies or early scenarios of digital transformation from the beginning to the end users. So we would like actually to inform our innovation process through the experience, adoption, and challenges that our end users may face uh, with, with a certain digital intervention. Now, this is, this is quite unique because if you see most of the interdisciplinary institutes around the world, they're usually reactive, rather proactive. The proactiveness into the generation and design of new technology is what actually makes us distinct if we would like to benchmark ourselves with other institutes like ourselves around the world. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Dimitra. Um, I think it, uh, it's very important uh, you've given us a very good uh, uh, introduction. Now, how do you actually use the BDFI uh, to embed you know, community-based uh, uh, innovation in your research and practices? Uh, uh, early on, you, you, there was a mention about the Bristol approach. What's, what's special about this? Well, there's a lot of special things about the Bristol approach, uh, but working actually with our city, with our region and our communities, especially when we're talking about digital and smart, has been a very, very distinct approach for Bristol and the Bristol region. So within BDFI, we are working with four 
specific communities, especially those four communities are specifically digitally unprivileged, underprivileged communities. So we are working with uh, the Knoll West Media Center, the Black Southwest Network with Babasa and with Asli Community Housing. So all these communities, and if there are questions I can explain about them, they are actually in places within our city that they have certain challenges in terms of inclusion and equality challenges, but also they're quite distinct with each other. So what we want working with these communities is to actually understand what are the opportunities, what are the challenges, and what are the barriers of digital adoption, and if possible, to drive a bottom-up approach to digital innovation. I would like to give you some examples on that, if I may. So during COVID, and COVID gave us quite a lot of data and, you know, digital inclusion situations to work with and understand better what the challenges are. We work with Knoll West Media Center to understand where actually uh, digital inequalities arises within the community. So we have done, and especially my co-director, uh, Susan Halford, uh, led on this. We worked with questionnaires, but also very deeply within the community to understand where actually the problem lies. Is it the devices? Is it the skills? Is it actually access to internet or affordable access to internet? And we came out with some quite interesting actually questions. As you may imagine, it's a combination, most poss possibly combination of all the, these things. But what actually arised out of our study is actually a for affordability to connect to the internet. That is the biggest barrier. So as a result uh, of this, we are working now with the city council and the high sheriff of Bristol to actually bring together funds so we can subsidize subscription to the to internet services in some of these communities. With Black Southwest, Southwest Network, we have been working with them on actually delivering, help them, help them to deliver. We are not delivering, we help them an online decolonized museum uh, for Black communities within Bristol. So we realize that actually the way that history is presented is very much biased at the moment. So how you can give, for instance, augmented reality or virtual reality, customized and personalized experience that they are aligned with people's demographics, culture, ethnicity, age. So how we can make history personalized and aligned with people's perception, you know, and uh, the way that they would like to learn about their past. And of course, the past of Black community at Bristol is a very big topic of discussions right now. We are working with our city planners and we would, because we can offer them tools where they can experience the future of our city now and actually improve planning of streets, of squares, of transport and so on. But for us, community is not only civic communities. Communities are also our very, very uh, well-developed digital sector here. For instance, we have very big sector around manufacturing, which is evolving now into digital manufacturing. So one of the questions that we are working with the manufacturing sector is if, for instance, from today, tomorrow, all our manufacturing goes to automated manufacturing, industry 4.0, what is going to happen to the workforce and how we can develop, for instance, skills to our workforce within our workforce in order to be able to be prepared for that digital <laughs> transformation. Another example is our ports. I mean, Bristol has some quite major ports in the country. So what is happening in our future of ports or our future of, of borders when we are going from today to a Brexit situation? next month and what is going to be this to mean for our logistic industry, for our truck drivers, for food distribution and so on. So for us communities, a quite wide range starts with our civic communities all the way to our industrial communities, to our local government, to our city and the region. Thank you, that was brilliant. Um, I really like your, your, your perspective that you are problem solving uh, uh, oriented and you embed yourself in the community 
That means you, know, you, you look at it not just from a high level, but also get down to grips with the last mile problem. Now, you know, the, 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 the problem with technology always is people think that it's the preserve of engineers. But I like the way that you, you, you brought the sociology part of it, the organizational part of it. And how do you marry, you know, how do you marry the two to solve the problems of the community, right? And, 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 and that, that, is, that embedding that in the community is very important. But why don't you give us a few more examples? How do you do this, you know, uh, to, to take into consideration the, uh, the, the ESG, you know, the, the, the ecological, the social, the governance issue in, 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 in driving the, 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 the digital part? Yeah, so just to say that engineers are great, actually. I'm an engineer. And during the COVID situation, I have been congratulating myself. I'm a telecoms engineer. I have been innovating on the internet space. So I congratulate myself and my community every morning because actually it is my community that kept the world going. And it's my community that sure. makes, for instance, this webinar or this uh, session, you know, happen right now. And engineers have a great sense of social responsibility. We are not the people that we are just in our labs, you know, or in front of a computer coding. So there is a great sense of social responsibility. However, taking a, away, you know, engineering, recent experience has actually really highlighted the dependency that we are having globally, you know, not only as a country, but globally on digital infrastructure. And actually what we say is it made actually the invisible visible. So we have seen really the extent of digital inequalities, digital poverty, issues around privacy in the digital world have come out extremely prominently. So responsible innovation and how we can tackle these issues, it is very important for the future. And BDFI, you know, realized this and articulated this well before the pandemic. The fact that we cannot innovate anymore in silos, but we have to bring disciplines together. It's not only social sciences and engineering, it's also humanities, arts, you know, our uh, colleagues from medical sciences, that they all looking at digital transformation and digital actually is everywhere now. There's not a single sector that is not digital. So sustainability, uh, digital infrastructure is responsible for quite a lot of the CO2 emissions. It is predicted that it's going to be around 20% of the CO2 emissions are going to be attributed to digital infrastructure. Privacy and security, we need to do privacy and security by design, taking into account, you know, the end user and actually personalization of privacy, for instance, to the end user and has to be inclusive. Uh, both in terms of the use of the technology, but also models for adoption of technology, specifically business models for adoption of the technology. So how can I have an inclusive business model, digital business model? It is very important. So BDFI exactly is breaking these silos. We don't allow innovation to happen and then think how this innovation is going to be used. The team that we bring together to drive innovation from, from concept all the way to adoption is a multidisciplinary uh, team. So from the very beginning, when I would like, for instance, to start designing the smartphone of the future, I would start thinking, what is the energy consumption? It's simple, engineers are doing this. But actually, what are the privacy features? What are the access features? Is this going to be accessible for the very young that you, Andrew, said are very digitally literate to the very old? So all these issues from the very beginning, from the design states, you know, as engineers, we have inputs and outputs, our number of inputs and outputs that we have to address out of a digital box. They have to be multi multidisciplinary inputs and outputs now. And this is exactly what BDFI is doing. So our labs are going to be socio-technical labs, as I mentioned. So we are going to have a computer uh, and scientists doing coding, an engineer, you know, creating hardware, a social scientist, a colleague from humanities. And we are all go or from economics or from our law school. And we are all have to work together put together what are the requirements beyond engineering performance 
and therefore creating a better technology for the future. Thank you, Dimitra. What you're saying is music to my ears. Um, I've always been against silos, okay? Everybody working in their own silo and not talking to each other. <clears throat> However, Andrew, this is not easy to be done. We don't have oh, the absolutely. kind of education right now to make this happen. So our universities, like my university, has to provide our schools. We have to provide a different streams of education. So people, they have to come with more interdisciplinary awareness to be able to speak at first the same language before we start doing what we are trying to, to, to do here. Right, because what you're saying is actually, this is multidisciplinary, right? You know, you, you're really creating a platform to get people to talk to each other. That's you right. You know, we talk to us in digitally, but actually uh, digital itself is a moral issue, right? I mean, the pandemic is a moral issue. And, and, and if, we, you know, we, if we can talk with different languages and get everybody on the same page, then we can work together. At the present moment, as long as everybody's saying, you know, I don't like you, you don't like me, you know, we're not gonna work together. We can't solve many of the problems that we have. But because digital is so new, everybody's interested in knowing about this, we can break that barriers down. Now, so the, the, the key question about uh, uh, technology is about the concentration, you know, uh, at the present moment, only a few uh, actually, you know, sort of hold the big platforms, right? Something like about 80% um, of the profits uh, of the, 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 the digital space is made by five big companies, as we all know. So how do we ensure, from your perspective, this democratization of technology? Oh, democratization. <clears throat> so let's let's go to what I feel democracy is and see how BDFI actually address this. So democracy first means my voice matters. So what we do within BDFI is actually we bring the users of the future technology as part of the co-creation process from the very beginning. So we actually create technologies with the people that they are going to be using the technologies. And I mentioned people is not only people, as I mentioned before, they are the straight consumers of technologies like yourself and myself, but also is, you know, the industrial sectors, the public sectors, the cities. So if actually the end user voice matter, that is a first step of democratization of technology. Now, the second part of, of democracy is actually transparency and trust. So how I operate digital infrastructures in a transparent way. I mean, we spend so much time on neutrality of the internet, which we are losing now. And, uh, you know, and then in a trusted way, how everybody could feel that digital is transparent and Trust it is a very important part and key questions of the BDFI. And also democracy is by definition a foundation for a better future. So creating sustainable technologies, resilient technologies and secure technologies, there should be you know, a requirement for every single bit of technology that we are producing. Again, I go back to socio-technical if we are actually established socio-technical methodologies, all these things would come together because socio-technical methodologies means participatory, it means transparent, it means trust, trusted, it means responsible in terms of sustainable and in terms of resilient. So, so those are the main elements that we're putting forward in order to make actually to democratize the future of digital. Great. I think, you know, can you give us an example of one group that you're working with at the very small uh, micro enterprise level or the, you know, NGO level that, that, that represents the, this, this type of work that they're doing? Because I think, you know, people see it conceptually, but it would yes. be very nice if you give an example of the collaboration between the private sector, the government sector and, 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 and Bristol University. Yes, I'll give you the example of the Norway Media Center which is a community organization, it's a third sector organization <clears throat> with actually a very, very big focus on digital within their community. So some of the, some of the examples is uh, 
how we can educate our young people, but also how we can introduce digital services across homes with uh, that they are actually inhabited by the older population in order to get the benefit of digital. So we are working very closely with this organization, but with the, the way that we are working is that actually we bring, we are create, we created a digital hub within the organization. We absolutely respect that they know better than us, so we don't go and patronize. We say we are going to create a digital hub within your organization, and then you are going to drive the kind of technology and the kind of environment that you need for the community. We are here to support you, but you are the drivers and therefore you are creating, you know, the kind of solutions that your community needs. And these kind of solutions, they start from skill developments and how they would like to develop and consume, you know, content, for instance, for digital skills, but goes all the way to creating community-based manufacturing, for instance, they manufacture their own sensors and they install their sensors in their own homes. So the sensors actually that they create themselves within the community, they trust them because they, come, they are coming from a trusted supply. Now, this may seem a very actually concentrated and very, if you like, bespoke way of doing things. However, we have another partner, which is British Telecom, and is the biggest service provider in the UK. They got very excited about this. And they say, how we can work now with this community organization so we can learn from their own digital service creation, how we can then create services that they are most suited for our community. So it starts with a bottom-up innovation and creation of requirements and demonstration of an environment. And then that attracts big industry because now BT are very much interested to see how they can adopt and learn from this experience that is created within our communities. And we have many of these activities around our city and now it goes beyond our city. For instance, uh, uh, I, just a year ago almost, I was in New York. They're doing something similar in Harlem. They call it Silka Harlem. We are now start collaborating to share experience across what's happening in New York with similar kind of culture, what's happening at Bristol, what are the commonalities and differences? Can we spread this now, these learnings around the world and make it make this community-based bottom-up innovation to become a mainstream methodology? Those are the things that actually BDFI would like to demonstrate and introduce a breakthrough on how we are doing things. Does this Thank answer you your that was, question, yeah. Andrew? That's, that's a very good uh, uh, answer. You know, you've brought how you can bring, bring the big guys, the government and the, the small guys together is, is very critical because this is, this is what many of us across the world has to learn how to do. Because you know, the pandemic has told us we can't solve it alone. We have to do it together. That's a very important message. Now, uh, I, I, I cannot resist asking you one last question during this session, which is what do you think from the future perspective, what do you think is your biggest barrier to achieving what you want to achieve? My biggest barrier, um, well, I mean, I don't want to go to things that you are going to hear from everybody else about security and privacy. And please, this is my very personal view, what I'm going to say now. What I want to see for the future is actually our physical world and our digital world to start looking very much like each other. So how we can achieve this convergence between physical and digital and move from one world to the other seamlessly. So today, Andrew, I would have liked not to sit and look at you on a screen. <laughs> I would have liked, although virtually, to have a very physical experience. I would like to have my hologram in your office looking at your eyes, if holograms can see on the eyes. But I would like my world, actually, you know, our digital world to feel like a physical world. And there is a long way getting there, but for sure we are going to get there. And that is going to break completely the barriers between what is our physical experience and our digital experience. And in some ways is extremely exciting, in some ways is very scary, but if we do it responsibly, 
we are looking at an amazing future, I think. Thank you very much, uh, Dimitra, for wonderful answers to very tough questions. Now, so we, I think we can move on to the second session and I think we can ask uh, uh, Professor Tanzi Jessup, you know, uh, you know, about digital learning because that's what it's all about. How do we learn digitally? Tanzi. Fantastic, thanks, Andrew. Um, and such a fascinating uh, session from uh, Dimitra. I suppose I just want to talk you through um, the rapid change we've made at Bristol uh, since March, uh, since COVID, and just discuss some of the challenges and opportunities. And I suppose, beginning with what uh, Dimitra said about convergence between the digital and the physical, um, we've attempted to have a blended learning uh, um, 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 experience for our students. And it's not as sophisticated as a hologram, but we've got some digital elements to the curriculum and some in-person elements. But within the digital, we've also tried to humanize the pedagogy so that uh, even though we haven't got uh, the teacher's hologram, we've got a more uh, empathetic and relational way of teaching to kind of soften the edges of technology and bring students in. So let me just walk you through some of the challenges. I think in March when COVID struck, uh, the biggest challenge was the sense of accelerated change. A second challenge was that in our body of uh, 3,500 academics, um, probably 20% of them might have been digital aficionados and probably 80% of them struggled to press which button. I'm not trying to caricature my colleagues, but a lot of them are fantastic at research, at teaching, and have done this in traditional ways. And, you know, they can do PowerPoints, but the digital world and the virtual learning environment which supported it uh, was a repository for readings and PowerPoints and sessions. It wasn't a, a living uh, experience of learning. I think a third challenge was uh, speedily working through our IT infrastructure to ensure that our academic colleagues had the tools they needed to use and that our students had access, connectivity and hardware, and we're still working on that in terms of exactly what Demetra said, digital poverty, digital equity, different uh, range of connectivity. I think a, a fourth challenge is also an opportunity. Uh, there was an article recently in, in the policy um, platform called Wonky in the, in, in, in the UK, which was saying that um, we need to wean our students off teaching because the digital is actually about learning, not teaching. And I think that's been a real shock for our students because what we've done is created learning design that has reset teaching at Bristol. It's been an opportunity for much more active learning, for student-centered teaching, and the learning design has reflected that in a way that students are interacting and doing things before and after short inputs. So it's a much more active and engaging experience online. And I think that's been interesting for our students because it's been a step change in how they normally learn. We've done a pulse survey of two and a half thousand students recently. And what we found is that 82% of our students are saying uh, that they learn really well in the online environment. So that's really reassured us. When I think about colleagues, and I'll just, because a lot of you might uh, uh, come from, from uh, FM, from economics, finance and management, I just want to talk you through how some of our colleagues in economics have humanized the curriculum. One of my colleagues called uh, Pavel Kuchar talks about small things that make a big difference. And at the time we transitioned to online learning, he read a book called Small Things in the Digital World. And so in a traditional setting before, he'd always asked first year economists, he'd said in the first session, so, so why are you studying economics? And he said they'd be sitting in a circle in a small group. And the first student would say, I want to be a banker, like Andrew. And then the second student would say, oh, I really want to know how to read the Financial Times. And he said, and then they just repeat that through the class. I want to be a banker. I want to read the Financial Times. And he said it became cliched and boring. So in reading this book, he decided with the very diverse groups of students he has, that the best way to open this, uh, the session, it was online. And he said to students, I want you to give me the story of your name. Tell me your name. 
and we'll we'll do a, a thing around the story of your name. And he said it was earth shatteringly different because you had a Nigerian student with a Chinese student, with an Indian student, with a British student, with a Scottish student, with a Greek student, with a South African student, all with particular stories that attached to their names. And he said it opened up a cultural window for all the students and they all knew each other and they knew each other's names from there then on. And then, you know, the, the, the level of empathy and humanizing the curriculum in economics had started with that uh, group of students. The other thing that our um, staff are doing to uh, engage students in, in their learning is to use so much more of the software. So a lot of our staff use something called Padlet, which is anonymous. They use the chat a lot as well, but there are polls and quizzes and all kinds of software that engage students. And really, if you were a student at Bristol today, what you would find is you would find three ways of learning. You'd come to class and you'd wear your face covering and you'd sit in a small group and you'd engage in some conversation or a lab. If you're in the STEM subjects, shout out for the engineers, Demetra. And, you know, there, there's a sense in which you, you do some of that. In, and and, and that, is, that is less of the curriculum because of social distancing. So students, in a way, describe that as golden time. There's not much of it. So in the labs, everyone's attending because you get more out of it because there's less of it. Demand is high. Um, and then the second aspect of learning is invisible to students when they first arrive. They, they, uh, there's a lovely faculty rep. Um, he's from um, Bangalore. And he said to me, he's in economics. He said to me, Tansy, when I arrived, I was disappointed when I looked at my timetable because it had a couple of in-person sessions and then some synchronous live lectures, webinars. And he said, I thought, you know, they've sold me a, they've sold me a lemon. And he said, then... <laughs> I, I realized after a week that a lot of my content was newly minted, brilliant, asynchronous content that I could flexibly put up and in, pick up and interact with. So what our staff have done mm. is they've designed into our learning environment, into Blackboard, fantastic digital content, bite-size Zoom interviews or lectures, and they may be porous border type of Zoom interviews with a development economist in Peru. You know, there's a sense in which we can do that so much more easy, easily. And then there'll be pre-tasks that students have to think through something, they'll watch something, and then there'll be an activity that they do in a group or in a discussion board together. And then they'll come to class much better prepared. And then there'll be some sort of after washing up activity asynchronously. So, there are three aspects then. There's live classes, there's live online classes, and there's this platform of flexible asynchronous, which works really well for part-time students as well, and for students in international areas because they can pick it up at any stage. So it's been, it's been an incredibly exciting journey. I think our staff are uh, tremendous, I'm so proud of them, but so enthusiastic about what they've done. And what we're starting to think about now in January, we're running a whole series of conversations about shaping the educational future of Bristol post COVID, because most of our staff are saying we can't go back to how it was. We've learned so much. We've got a much more expansive curriculum. There's so much that's exciting that we want to hold on to. We need to shape the future with the digital in mind. So for me, it's been a, a glorious journey, really challenging, but really exciting. Thanks, Andrew. Well, thank you. Um, <clears throat> Tanzi, thanks for bringing so much energy to this. You know, the problem with digital learning, especially in Zoom, is that it, it, you get a lot done in one hour, but it's absolutely exhausting. People, somebody yes. of my age, I have to go and sleep for, for, for two <laughs> hours just to recharge myself. But you've made digital human. You know, it, it, it's very important for, 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 for people to realize that in the digital world, we are human. We are not yes. digits. No, we're not digits, we are. Right? We're not so just we pixelations. We communicate, <clears throat> you know, at a, at a very different plane. Yeah. And, and, and that's so, so we, we can't see this in, in, in simplistic, you know, zero one, zero one uh, uh, way of looking at things, but we really need to be, you know, be, be to engage actually. And, 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 yeah. and, 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 you know, be, be on the net anyway. Yeah. Thanks, Andrew. I'm going to ask you a question now, but I just want to pick up on one thing um, that 
Demetra mentioned, which has been an opportunity beyond the orthodox curriculum at Bristol. Uh, I have a colleague who's a professor in economics called Alvin Birdie, and um, he leads our uh, Decolonizing the Curriculum group, and it's a network with a whole lot of academics and students. And in four weeks, he has designed an open unit, a MOOC, on decolonizing the curriculum and decolonization, which launches on the 28th of December. And it's open, it's a for the public good Bristol Futures unit. Uh, and there's another one coming down the tracks called Migration and Mobilities about refugees that he's helped our Migration Mobilities Bristol uh, group develop. So the opportunities of the digital to have a much more, a much stronger social justice footprint that is interdisciplinary uh, are just enormous, re really exciting. So sorry, Andrew, I, ca I came back on the on the on that question, but I'm gonna I'm gonna ask you a question now um, and start the Q and A if that's okay. I've got a pre-prepared question, and I think I'll I'll go straight to Andrew and ask him a geopolitical question, really. I mean, he's been with the World Bank and the Asia Global <laughs> Institute. So this is the question for you, Andrew. In the next five years, will Southeast Asian nations have to choose between a China or a US-centric digital world? That's an excellent question. Now, we had uh, uh, Secretary of State uh, uh, Pompeo going around the region saying, you must choose. Where, you know, you either choose China or you're going to choose America. <clears throat> and th th we're going to have splinternet. You know, we're going to have technology in which, you know, China is going to be cut off from this or that. And do you know what the biggest response was? The biggest response was, we don't want to choose. We in South, Southeast Asia want to be friends with everybody. We don't want to choose, right? Why should we be forced to choose? Now, your, your, your point about the, 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 the world today, uh, we need to, this idea of decolonization, actually is not about decolonization. It's about that, you know, you really need to look at things from, multiple uh, perspectives, mm -hmm. not just one, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, the, the science and technology way of looking at ways is very good. But what did this US election tell us? That 50% uh, or 47% to be exact, don't believe, you know, in facts and, 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 mm -hmm. and, and logic. They, mm -hmm. they believe on emotion, yeah. which goes to tell us that we must be more humble in ac accepting that the world is very diverse. Mm. In, increasingly so, right? It's in, increasingly going to be many different cultures, many different values, many mm. different perspectives. And, and, and therefore, asking somebody to say, you must stand on this side or you must stand on yeah. this side. Human beings have been wondrous from day one. We wandered out of Africa and then we changed and we're changing every day. So we're very diverse. We cannot be just white or black or brown or, or yellow. Mm. Uh, we, we, we are, you know, the, the one lesson from DNA studies that I studied was nobody's pure. We're mm -hmm. all mixed up. Yes. And, and, and therefore to insist that this is only one way is right or the other way is wrong, I think is a wrong way to teach our young. Because mm -hmm. only by cooperating, only by understanding that we all live in one planet. And if we destroy this planet, we all lose. Mm, okay, mm. so, so uh, you know, let me say this, we should, you know, the world is actually changing because we are all hybrids. You know, we move from one standard to the other, you know, what, you know and, 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 and one, one standard may be a winner, it, be, it looks as if it's going to be winner take all, and then suddenly a COVID comes and, and flattens everything, right? So, you know, the, life is changing all the time. So I'm not a believer in, you know, this is absolutely good or this is absolutely evil. You know, mm. there is good in, 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 in bad persons and there are bad, bad things in good persons. And as we all know, the, uh, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. Okay? <laughs> so, I, you know, what we really now need to do is to talk and say, well, we agree to disagree, but we're not going to fight over this. We, you know, mm. we, we agree to disagree and let's see whether we can work to solve our common challenges. And mm. that's the more important part, not fight. Mm. Brilliant. Andrew, what a um, what a almost Nobel Peace Prize winning answer oh, from no, you. No, no, no. <laughs> I'm just a wild kid from Borneo. <laughs> <laughs> 
No, but thank you. A really interesting answer and uh, textured about the, you know, let's not do the binaries, let's not, let's not have the polarization, but let's draw on our diverse human community to solve the challenges. Absolutely. My first question for, for Demetra is about um, societal change. I think it's a really interesting question. So um, Antonia Henderson has asked, what will be the single most profound societal change that results from global digitization? Oh, that is that is a interesting that is a interesting question. Uh, we are going through global digitization for a very long time, so that's not exactly a future. It's happening. It's happening now, and. I could say a lot of profound things. First of all, I would again go back to say what we are living now. So the fact that actually we, we can do events, we can provide health, we can provide education uh, through our digital infrastructure and the digitization that has happened that far. Um, most profound, I mean, I'll go from the BDFI perspective. We would like actually everybody to be a stakeholder on the way that we are driving digitization for the future. We don't want these big corporates, although we are working with the big corporates, we don't want actually the big corporates to design and enforce on us digital solution. We would like to be stakeholders. And when I say we, not BDFI, but everybody. But in order to make this happen, we have actually to develop a framework and solid propositions, how this would be possible, what would be the benefits to society, but also importantly, what is going to be the benefits to future economy. For mm -hmm. instance, no actual digital proposition is going to make it un unless there is a tangible benefit or what this brings as well to the economy. So can we drive different business models for our digital futures being for us as citizens, but also for our industry? And that would make a very, very strong proposition. I'm not sure if I answered your question. It's such a wide question. Um, but at the moment, we are, being, we are being provided services. So we have the big service providers that provide services. We have no say about these services. If you are at the moment, you have a certain broadband provision, Tansi, you cannot say anything about this. You can't change it. How we can be part of digital in the future. And we are actually going to be personalized and control our digital experiences. That is going to be where we would like to, to get. Mm. Brilliant. Thanks, Dimitra. Really interesting answer, quite textured to a really wide-ranging big question. Keep the questions flowing. Uh, I've got a few, and I'm, I'm probably going to um, give the next one to Andrew, uh, which is about regulation and monopoly, and he's done a bit of that in his time. So do you think, Andrew, the lack of regulation and monopoly status of the biggest digital players hinders innovation? And how should regulation develop? It's slightly connected to Demetra's uh, answer in terms yes. of, is it owned by all of us or is it a few people actually dictating the terms uh, to us? What, what do you think around that, Andrew? What, Lack of what, regulation and monopoly status. Uh, absolutely. I think uh, uh, the previous question by uh, Antonia was very good. The issue is that before uh, the, the digitization, uh, basically, the world was divided between government and markets. All right. But suddenly, we have a third force emerging mm -hmm. and connected through digitization, the internet, which is civil society. Right. Think about this. Uh, you know, we, you know, if we have a false binary, we, we the, the false binary is everything is government or everything is state is market. And suddenly, there are, you know, market is all about profits and government is all about regulation, right? And suddenly the civil society has come up and said, no, I can do things without for profit, you know? And I, you know, the, the biggest uh, innovators in, in technology, uh, in biomedicine are by the foundations. They are funding uh, change, right? And at the same time, the biggest threat uh, to uh, social security, uh, uh, you know, are these transnational uh, 
uh, extremist movements, right? And they're connected through the internet. So to a large extent, we, we're moving into a very new world in which the, the state, the market, and civil society need to work together and actually uh, in a very complex manner um, that is no longer so clear cut. So let me give you an ex example. You know, if you talk to an economist about climate change, they will tell you, you create a carbon market, you know, everything will be solved. Well, uh, somebody said, well, you know, some investment bankers will make a lot of money from the carbon tax. I mean, sorry, the carbon uh, market, but a lot of people will be cheated, okay? So on issues of privacy, on issues of protection against cybercrime, you need the state. But how do we get the rules uh, uh, to be agreed upon? That will depend upon civil society. Because you know, the, gov the, the market is vested interest. Of course, I want to protect my interest uh, and I want to collect all your, your personal data so that I monetize this. But you know, I will raise my hand as a civil, you know, civil society person and say, hello, you know, you, you know, we can't allow you to be a monopoly, right? Mm -hmm. And, 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 and then, then you, you, you get to the government and the government says, well, you know, all my elections are, are funded by, by, by big money. So uh, of course I'm going to side with one side. And that's, the, that's where we've got into this deep trouble. So the conversation between the, the government, the, the, the market and civil society is only just beginning in the digital space because previously, a civil society you know, in, 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 in Malaysia can't talk to a civil society uh, in Africa. But today, uh, they can be networked on the same uh, 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 internet, right? So it changes the whole ball game. And I think you will, you were gonna get feedbacks into the system that we have not fully understood. Uh, and that's what is so exciting about it. But let me tell you, this is very tough stuff. Mm, brilliant. Even Thanks. for a regulator. Yeah, very interesting answer. Um, so uh, we've time for one more question and I've been uh, trawling through the fascinating uh, questions that are coming in. Um, and uh, I suppose one of them's quite interesting as a quick question, mm -hmm. Demetra, have you got examples of highly practical digital innovation applications that you've implemented around the world that could be applied in countries like Malaysia? So it's a quick question because I'm going to try and squeeze one more in. Right. I have so many, so many. And actually, I have examples I, that of what we created here at Bristol. It has been adopted so quickly everywhere. And I'm going to give you two examples. One is a fun one. So back in June 2019, and that comes from my 5G uh, work, we actually did the world's first 5G music lesson. So we have a very well-known musician in the UK called Jamie Callum. He was launching his new album, he got in touch and he said, can we use your 5G networks to actually teach musicians one of my new songs and we demonstrate this. So he was in the London Amphitheater in the city of London. We engaged musicians at Bristol and Birmingham. They never met before. You know, they, they met together over these new super networks and they, they jumped together and then they performed together one of Jamie Callum's uh, songs. It was amazing experience. And let me tell you, if we use this Zoom session, we cannot do this because we cannot synchronize to jump together in music. We cannot do this. So that was a world's first. What happened next? is actually we had BBC Proms conducting us. We had Massive Attack conducting us uh, because they wanted to do a virtual around the world uh, performance. Um, Andrew Lloyd Webber, you know, he, he did a piece for us and you can see something like this, how it can take by storm, uh, you know, the music industry, but also the future of teaching, the future of education, music education could be transformed not only at Bristol and Malaysia, but all around the world. Second one, and this has been adopted in many places now, we actually installed AI, special AI in our surveillance cameras in Bristol Harbour site. We have a lot of students, 
before the lockdown, they were coming, they were going there, they were getting drunk, falling in the water. And as you know, Tamsi, we have a lot of deaths or injuries mm -hmm. because of this. So mm -hmm. we have done this installation of quite simple AI solution in our thermal cameras in the harbor side. And, uh, and actually we connect these cameras back to the Bristol Operations Center, which are sitting all the monitoring for critical services. So we had one Saturday night, two, stu two, two of our students falling in the water. They were picked up very quickly. We were all over BBC News, 5G cameras, you know, just uh, saving lives. They were not even 5G cameras, but they saved lives. This algorithmic work, which is actually, is, is being now adopted to so many places that they have water and students, particular water and students, is a little combination. So, so those are big, small pieces of things that we've done them. A lot of those were funds. They were done by our students, but with that fact, focus on society and real problems, a real fun with the Jamie column was real fun. And those have been adopted everywhere. We never thought that music experience, how relevant was going to be during COVID, for instance. Brilliant uh, examples. So those, those are two examples. I have hundreds, hundreds of examples. <laughs> and I'm sure that actually most of these examples are very relevant to Malaysia and ev everywhere else in the world. Brilliant. Thanks so much, Dimitri. I'm sure if people go onto your website, they can find they can more find, examples. They can find or they can contact me yeah. directly. I mean, yeah. I, we, can, we have videos and we have uh, stories and all this, uh, quite a lot of material. Brilliant. I'm afraid I was thinking we'd squeeze in another question, but Sorry. the story was great. Um, and I'm sorry, I was actually going to ask the question about AI and employability and its negative impacts, but I think I'm going to leave that. Uh, but I want to say um, uh, thank you. Uh, I'm sorry we didn't manage all of the questions. Uh, there were so many good questions, and I, I, I'm really sorry we didn't answer the questions about schools, but we'll, we'll perhaps think about them and craft a little response. But I, I want to thank mainly Andrew and Demetra for joining us today. Uh, I think it's been a brilliant session. I think it's been groundbreaking theoretically and uh, just thinking through these big issues uh, with two of the world experts, you know, I, I just think it's been an, an, an amazing session. I hope that all of you have really enjoyed the session uh, and found it interesting and feel proud to be part of uh, the unique and important work that Bristol is doing to transform digital technologies. Uh, I know you can't come and see us in person, but please stay in touch with us. Uh, if you haven't yet joined Bristol Connects, you can do so on the website. And there, there's a busy program of digital events which can be found on our website. We'll be logging off in a moment, but for anyone who would like to stay and say hello to our alumni, the meeting will be kept running for another 15 minutes and you'll be able to use the chat function at the bottom of your screens to network with each other. Do keep in touch, stay safe and keep well and enjoy the rest of your day or night. Uh, but it's been brilliant being with you. Thank you so much. And, and special thanks to Demetra and Andrew and to the Alumni Association and to all the participants who've given of their time, I mean, the attendees to give questions and, and thoughtfully contribute. So thank you very much. It's been brilliant to be with you. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs>